just reading from the Unity of Christ, Christopher by Christopher A. Bealey. It's uh, the problem of Christology. Or, uh, let me see the contents. Yeah, origin, fourth century authorities as well. Like Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, Nicaea 325, and Athanasius of Alexandria. Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa and the Constantinople 381. And then the construction of Orthodoxy, uh, Augustine and the West, Cyril, Leo, and Chalcedon 451, and post Chalcedonian Christology. So it goes over all these things about uh, the Christological ideas. Yeah, basically going over the Christological controversies and stuff like that. Let me see, it says divinity and distinctness of Christ in the chapter of Origin of Alexandria. It just says that in Origin's view in this divinity or divine nature. And this is the first subject he treats in the main chapter on Christ and first principles. Origin argues throughout the, his major works that Moses, the prophets, the apostles, and Christ himself all declare that Christ is eternal divine son of God. Although he has been accused of, for centuries, of subordinationism or making Christ to be less divine than God the Father, Origen asserts, asserted the divinity of Christ is in stronger terms than any Christian theologian to date. It says that Origen argues that Christ is equal to God the Father in both divinity and eternity, and he possesses the same divine nature any powerful equal to the Father, that to that of the Father. Then it goes to the kenosis thing. I was arguing with an Arian about that. Like as Arian said that, uh, that because they think the same thing, right? The Arians and the, the Arius of Alexandria, right? He was Alexandrian. Yeah, because the dispute in Nicaea was between two two Alexandrians, which I don't really agree with either one. Maybe with maybe with Antonius, I agree with because. You know, like with, like Origen was saying, is an eternal divine nature, an uncreated essence, right? And these Arians, I noticed that they make the sun a created deity, so to say. Like even today, they sometimes still argue like this. And it says here, but it says here, like he emptied himself, though. But you know, in order to become man, so that that would be a problem, though, because like I was trying to explain to this Arian that that God cannot set aside what he is by nature or empty of himself what he is by nature like I was telling him like how, how is it that is possible like if God can do all things because he's all powerful but he's eternally all powerful right and so he cannot ever cease to be eternally powerful and so if he emptied himself of that then he would technically be cease to he would cease to be on he would cease to be all powerful though <laughs> So in order for him to even try, which I already use incoherent because it's like saying God becomes darkness, right? Which is something that God can never do. So God cannot change what he is by nature, not even empty himself. So it's like me saying, how do I set aside my human nature, right? This is what I am by nature. I cannot change what I am, right? I'm not God, but God cannot change what he is, you know? So that, that limitation, human limitation, it doesn't limit divinity, and so there's no reason to do anything to your divine nature, right? Because it's not the human limitations are not the limitations of divinity. If divinity has any limitations, right? Well, other than the fact that uh, I guess you could say that the divine cannot become uh, humanized or darkness, right? Maybe in that sense, divinity has limitations, but I don't know. That's just a thought, though. But I'm just looking over it because I'm just reading from here because, it, like I said, it traces the progression, right, of your single subject Christology. Because you know I disagree with it. Um, now they're all like building off each off of each other. On you know God the Word, the Logos, and it's kind of like. Uh, the more it progresses further into this understanding, right, it's like some of the church fathers leave you with uh, maybe a little bit less, right, maybe a better position, slightly better, but then some kind of leave you in a in a worse position. 
which is commentaries in John 1.11.8, as the, yes, is 118, yeah. As the word, the Son is, quote, as it were, an interpreter of the secrets of the mind, end quote. That is the Father. This principle is 1.2.3, by the communicative principle of God. This is the word, logos, is also the principle of all rational, logikos, existence. And we are created in the image of God by virtue of all of our rationality. Principles 1.3.6, 4.4.10. So similarly, the sun is also divine truth and life. Yeah, divine truth and life. See John 11.25, by which other beings truly exist and receive life again after they have fallen away from God and brought death upon themselves. Principles 1.2.4. In addition to arguing from biblical titles, Origen frequently opposes that he takes to be what he takes to be the heretical denial of the Son's divinity. But in order to adhere to receive will of faith, he writes in the concluding sections of First Principles, two views of Christ must be avoided, that Christ lacked, quote, any quality of the divinity, end quote, or that he was in any way separated from the divine being of God the Father. Rather, rather, than, rather than the divine, uh, the Son's divinity, uh, Rather, that the sun's uh, the sun's divine divinity is an incorporeal, incorporeal and invisible substance which cannot be divided into parts, or separated from God the Father. Principles four point four point three through four. That it is important that that Christ not lack any quality of divinity, and that is of the same substance, same being, right? Yeah, but that's kind of what I'm saying. Like Jesus is of the the quality of divinity, right? I said to be born of the Spirit. So it's really the Spirit he's born of. And the Spirit, I would associate him with God the Word. How he wears, how he has the name of the Father and represents everlasting deity, right? Divinity, the quality of divinity or so. It also represents the kingdom of heaven, right? The uncreated heaven where Jesus is born of. So that's why I'm saying that uh, there's also like, you could say it's a, a man born under the divine law of the spirit. This has to do with everlasting being, not so much properties like God, properties of God or something. Because when you speak of Jesus, you make, you make him sound like he's the deity or he's like a God with properties of God. I said, no, he's the man. Is a, I would say an everlasting man because he's born of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, right? The Holy Spirit, who comes from the Father and the highest heaven, right? It says that yet no sooner does Origen assert Christ's divinity than he immediately cautions his readers against another sort of misunderstanding, namely collapsing the distinct existence of Christ the Son into that of God the Father. Orthodox belief requires that the Son be conceived as a distinctly existing being. Origen's technical term for this is hypostasis, a word that will later become central to Orthodox theology through Origen's disciples, Basil Caesarea, and Gregory of Nazianzus. For Origen, a hypostasis is a, is a distinctly existing thing, a concrete entity or being. Uh, this is though not necessarily possessing a body and also something that exists in reality and not only in thought. Commentaries on John 10.2.12 and its discussion of the Son's divinity in the first principles. The origin is simultaneously concerned to avoid any suggestion that the Son does not exist distinctively, that is, hypostatically, principles 1.2.2. Similarly, in the commentaries of John, he interrupts this discussion of the title, quote, word, end quote, to criticize those who make too much of Christ's identity as the word. It says, quote, as if the Christ of God is word alone, end quote. It says commentary is in John 1.125. Specifically, origin is critical of those who imagine the Son of God um, too much in terms of a human word, which is merely a sound that proceeds from a single speaker, rather than appreciating this, that the Son of God is a divine being with his own particular name, uh, manner, of existence. Commentary dot John dot one point one fifty one and a being with life in himself, which he spoke a spoken word does not possess when when compared with the person who spoke it. Commentaries on John 
1.152 said indeed despite the predominance of the Logos idea taken uh, we must remember from the first verse of the gospel on which he is commenting that the origin normally speaks throughout the, his commentary of Christ as the quote son of God end quote. to be sure his Christology is a type of Logos doctrine but what exactly that entails must be borne out with careful scrutiny as we shall see divergences over how to characterize Christ as word were the cause of major divergences in the following century. A divine wisdom then the Son is more like a wise living being than he is like an impersonal reality that makes people wise by imparting itself into their minds. Principles 1.2.3 Wisdom should be conceived as quote an incorporeal hypostasis that is made up of various ideas that embrace the principles of the universe and which is living and as it were animate end quote this commentary john 1.244 the father son and holy spirit then are three distinct things or hypostases in this sense this is seed out celsus 8.12 we're talking about uh, the three, three divine or just confession of three distinct divine beings arises from a biblical account of three different character figures God the Father who raised Christ from the dead for example 1 Corinthians 15 15 must be different from Christ who was raised or else uh, Paul's statement makes no, no sense in the regard quote father and quote and quote son and quote are not different epanoia for the same divine being um, but they refer uh, refer to the distinctly, distinctly existing hypostasis since a father must have a child and a son must have a father from them, uh, for them to be truly a father and a son. Commentaries on John 12.46 uh, How in such passages, passages origin is opposing the view that scholars termed uh, monarchianism. Uh, one sort of monarchian position holds that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are merely different versions or manifestations of God but not distinct beings in themselves which is called modalism, right? And so that the uh, implication of the view, of the view implication of the view uh, of this view can be Jesus is the incarnate of God the Father, which holds the scandalous implication that God the Father suffered in the incarnation or patripassianism the second type of monarchian view is that God the Father adopted the human Jesus as his son which tends to imply that Christ is otherwise merely human, since he is not seen as the incarnation of a pre-existent divine entity. Commentaries on John 2.6 is that both monarchian positions seek to maintain the oneness of God by denying that the Son of God is a distinct divine being who became incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth. Now when it says here though, like when the monarchians so that uh, the scandalous implica implication that God the Father suffered in the incarnation, right? But that's like saying it's like that neither God the Son nor God the Father nor God the Holy Spirit, if if Jesus is a God like they are, right? And to say that God the Son died in his human nature is just as to me um, scandalous, right? It's just as scandalous because you're talking about a, a God that died in a human nature. That's why I say it's it's incoherent because you're speaking of God, but you're saying that. God died in the nature of a man, which is why it's backwards. It's like, but you, what you're really trying to say is the the man died, not the God. That's why I say it's like it cannot possibly be one person in two natures. In fact, I would accept more of the view where it says the monarchian view where it says here the second type that God the Father adopted a human son, but in the Bible where right, it says that the Father begot him, right. This day have I begotten thee, right? And Paul talks about the Galatians, where Jesus is born under the law, right? And of Mary, could be old covenant law, or because he's born of the Spirit, he's born under the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, right? And how Jesus makes this distinction about himself, how you are from below, I am from above, right? That an atom of God, atom of uh, heaven, heaven and flesh, just like the, the ways of heaven are higher than the earth, right? So even the son as a man makes this divine distinction. And so I would just take out the adopted son and say it is a divine begotten son. Because divinity is 
basically to me the divine nature is basically what has to do with the quality of God. And so it has does not mean that Jesus is a God or a begotten God, but a, a man born of the same essence of heaven, right? What is everlasting about God, which is to be of the Holy Spirit, right? And so that's why I say you don't have a begotten deity, that you still have an uncreated divinity, but it is a man that partake of it or inherits it from the Spirit of God, represents the Father. But basically like the Trinitarian Monarchian view is one of the most characteristic ways in which origin defines Christ's identity brings together these two concerns about his divinity and distinctness. The Son of God is divine, Origen says, because he exists and possesses all the qualities of divinity, quote, essentially, end quote. That is, in his very being or nature, rather than by receiving these qualities with, from without, as all other creatures must, quote, the only begotten Son of God is wisdom ex existing essentially, end quote. Principles 1.2.2, as similarly, Christ is the Son of God, quote, by nature, end quote, and that, and the only being who is a natural child is of God, or is, um, the, and the only, that yeah, the Son of God, quote, by nature, that Christ is the Son of God, quote, by nature, end quote, and the only being who is a natural child of God, principles 1.2.5. So by contrast, Christians can become sons and daughters of God only by grace, or accidentally, Principles 4.4.10, a related aspect of the Son's essential divinity is the simplicity of the divine nature that he possesses. Principles 1.5.3, by contrast with the complexity of all other natures, it is the very definition of the Son of God, his inner rationale, as it were, to be divine intrinsically, a fact that he shares with only the Father and the Holy Spirit. Every divine quality resides in the Son's essentially, not accidentally, as in creatures which makes the sun unchanging and unchangeable principles 1.2.10. Just says in the end, Origen's understanding of Jesus Christ is a strange paradox. On the one hand, he articulates Christ's divinity, distinctness, and eternal relation to God the Father, as well as Christ's full humanity to an extent that was unprecedented in its time and in a way that would later be seen to be faithful to the biblical witness and the rule of faith. In this respect, Origen proved to be foundational for later thinking about Christ's divinity and humanity and the mystery of the Trinity. But on, the one, on the other hand, uh, he manages to keep the two spheres of reality neatly separated, and he seems at a loss about how God might affect the created order of physical bodies and human wills, and particularly how the darkest and most threatening aspects of our existence could be taken up in the divine economy. And this, in his Christological dualism and moralizing spirituality, we see the full effect of Origen's philosophical worldview on his theology. And it says here that the legacy of his Christology proved to be most unsettling in the succeeding centuries, uh, despite the tantalizing suggestion that Christ's nature as the invisible image of the invisible God inclines him towards the revelation of God to his creatures, uh, to creatures. Originally, uh, Origen generally works to keep the sun away from the dark abyss of Jesus' death, safely enclosed in the preserve of philosophical divinity. It's a broader sweep of patristic tradition, a pluralist trinitarianism, such as origin, uh, such as origins normally accompanies a highly unitive Christology, whereas a dualist Christology normally belongs with the sort of a monistic view of the Trinity that origin opposed. This tension is arguably the most deeply contradictory aspect of origin's work as a whole. Origen believed that orthodoxy must be received and reconstructed anew in each generation by inspired interpreters of scripture. For the patristic theologians who came after him, um, this reception ine inevitably involved grappling with Origen's own teaching about Christ, as we shall see. The long-term difficulties with Origen's theology were not primarily Trinitarian, as is often supposed, but Christological, and yet he seems to have been aware of this at some level. In First Principles, Origen voices his concern that the Incarnation is a profound ontological and conceptual problem. Accordingly, he issues a disclaimer that is also a challenge. Quote, if anyone can discover something better and prove that he says by clearer statements out of the Holy Scriptures, let his opinion be accepted in preference to mine. End quote. Principles 2.6.7. That is exactly what Christian theologians wrote to do for the next five centuries.
Even more unitive is Eusebius' statement, a statement of Jesus' statements about himself in John 3, quote, The one who comes down from heaven, in quote, Eusebius argues, cannot be the flesh of Jesus. It must be, quote, he himself, namely the light and word of God and only begotten and son, himself being all, all these things, in quote. E. Th. Th. 1.20. The reason for Eusebius' particular expression, again, seems to be contextual, namely in reaction to the strongly dualistic Christology of Marcellus. Eusebius opposes the sharp distinction Marcellus makes between Christ's flesh and his spirit. E. Th. Th. 3.10.11. So to make matters worse, Marcellus even allows that the Incarnate Son disagrees sometimes with God. See that Marcel.2.2. Here again, Marcellus' resistance to theological interpretations of certain biblical texts, refusing even to ascribe the titles, quote, Jesus, and quote, and Christ, yeah, quote, Christ, and quote, to the Word at all, also pushes in a dualistic direction. See that Marcel.2.3. And it's talking about how the matter of Christ ceasing to be human, uh, the dualistic picture of this man. And he says here, one key difference uh, from his earlier work is that Athanasius further develops the image doctrine that he largely assumed and against the pagans on the incarnation, which focuses on the human image in need of redemption rather than on the divine image. The work of Eusebius may have persuaded Athanasius that he needed to engage directly the originist image doctrine that played an important role in his opponent's uh, Christology. Whether he also made a further study of origin at the time is unclear. Either way, given the centrality of the idea in the work of origin, Alexander and Eusebius, it would certainly bolster Athanasius' case as a Catholic theologian to explain in what sense Christ is the image of God, both in order to, con to counter his opponents views and to give credence to his own. This is uh, Athanasius affirms that Christ is indeed the image of God apart from the Incarnation. And this is as origin. You see this taught in, against and against the denials of Marcellus. He makes the point using a variety of terms in his eternal existence as the word of God. Christ is, quote, the image and form of the divinity, end quote. The character, the, quote, form and appearance, end quote, and even the, quote, exact image of, end quote, of God the Father. And so doing, he stipulates that the Word uniquely communicates and reveals the divinity of the Father to creatures. He likewise affirms that the divinity that the Word conveys as image is the divinity of the Father as a primary sense. Uh, in a primary sense, uh, the Word is the image, Word wisdom, and offspring of the Father, the brightness of the Father's divine light, and on, and so on. So Anthony consistently preserves the notion that the Father is the source of, and principle of the Word. So central to originist tradition, C.A.R. 1.9, 14 through 15, 19 through 20, and Patton. And it is for this reason that the Son does the works of the Father, C.A.R. 1.61, 2.29, 3.6, 2.30, 12, 12. What's more is he makes the interesting supposition that the Word is the image of God to God, the Father himself, and that the Father sees himself in his image, and takes delight in what he sees. Proverbs 8.30, C.A.R.1.20, 2.82. Yet although Antonatius' language reaffirms the basic, this basic principle of origin's theology, his real concern is not with the word's communicative nature or role within the Trinity, as you see this was, but only with how that role bears on the question of the word's divinity. His many references to the word's identity and as image serve to argue that if it is the image of God, then it must be fully divine, against what he takes to be Arian denials of the word's divinity on the basis of its emanatorial status. In one passage, for example, he argues that just as the image of the emperor shows the form and appearance of the emperor, and anyone who worships the emperor's image is in fact worshiping the emperor himself, uh, so too the image of God shows the form of God and leads only to worship for the worship of God. See that AR dot three to five or uh, three point five. Once the word's divinity has been established, established, it is as if its identity as image is forgotten. In fact, the most striking thing about Athanasius' image doctrine, when we read the orations against the Arians, against the, their traditional background, concerns his treatment of the language of medi medi mediation. Even though he affirms that the Father is the source of the word, and that the word is the, is the eternal image and brightness of the Father, through whom the Father is known. 
Athanasius simultaneously, simultaneously denies that the Word is, in any sense, a, quote, mediator, end quote, of the divinity to creatures, except in its incarnate form. C.A.R. dot 1.59, 2.31. As Marcellus held, Athanasius argues that belief against Arians and Eusebians that God does not require a mediator for his work of creation and redemption. His favorite tactic is a reductio ad absurdum. If God requires a mediator, then wouldn't the mediator require yet another mediator, and so on ad infinitum. See that AR.2.26. To suggest that God needs a mediator, moreover, implies that God is weak and incapable of action. On the contrary, that God's will is sufficient in itself to achieve its desired effects, period. See that AR.2.29. Notably, Antonatius makes this argument most clearly in a passage that which he also recognizes that all things come to get come to be through the Son or Word of God, that the Word may, remains the radiance of God's light and the expression of His substance, and that the works of the Son reveal the divinity of the Father. See that AR.2.25-26, 30, 32-33. Eighty, at the time, at the same time that Antonius accepts that the word is image, structurally speaking, he paradoxically denies that it serves as a mediator of divinity in any sense, and said the word's identity as image merely proves that it is fully divine. Here lies a point of deep tension in Antonius's doctrine, which will send repercussions throughout several centuries of theological reflection and conciliar decrees. The force of his argumentation for the words divinity leads Antonius to ignore the other side of the Catholic theology. Antonius has either missed or consciously avoided the idea of the sons mediating. Fully, the fully, uh, full divinity, which Origen identified and Alexander plainly accepted, and his primary reason for doing so seems to be a defense, a defensive and desperate reaction against what he experiences as a growing Eusebian conspiracy. In this attempt to argue for the words divinity without any sense of mediation, Antonius' position is ultimately inconsistent. He does not care to acknowledge that the same question could be put to his to his own uh, Trinitarian scheme. Why does God need an image or word at all in order to convey the, his divinity to creatures? And why does the existence of the word not, uh, not also show God the Father to be weak? These are inconsistencies that Antonius studiously avoids. This is the orations against the Arians mark an important shift in Antonius's understanding of the Incarnation as well. But the most, the most significant component of this shift concerns his method of biblical interpretation. And it is here that the influence of Marcellus made itself felt most palpably. In terms of its structure and purpose, Antonius's understanding of the Incarnation is basically the same as it was in against the pagans on the Incarnation. Against the Arians assumes the doctrine of salvation that Antonius laid out in the former work. In order to reveal himself to us and to defeat death and the devil on the cross, God sent his word to become human in the fullness of time. See that AR.2.55. Here again, Antonius describes the Incarnation in ways that at first sound unitive, and again this is largely because he imagines Christ as the Word of God operating through a human body in the place of a human intellect. See dot AR dot two point three one three point six one four four um this is point four four uh, three point thirty one and pass him out of the goodness and pity for our condition. God quote had his son put on himself a human body and become human and be called Jesus, so that in this body offering himself for all, he might deliver all people from false worship and corruption and become himself Lord and King of all. See dot AR dot two point fourteen. And the second oration Antonius echoes earlier, language of joining to describe the word's relationship with his body, with its body. In order to be saved, humanity needed to be quote joined to God, end quote. And in the third oration, which was probably written a few years later, he further specifies that in Christ the Word actually, quote, sojourn in a human body, end quote. But contrast with the way it merely, quote, came into, end quote, the Old Testament saints, C.A.R.3.30, C. dot dot having, quote, made his own, end quote, the human flesh, C.A.R.C.3, yeah, dot three point three three. Jesus is himself, quote, God in the flesh, end quote, C.A.R.2.10, 12, three point fifty four.
It says, yet as before, it is a dualistic framework that ultimately governs Antonatius' Christology here. The orations against the Arians are full of qualifications that protect the word from undue involvement in human affairs. The distinctiveness of Antonatius' dualistic approach and the influence of Marcellus on his thought are clearest in his, t in his treatment of biblical references to Christ, which is, after all, the main burden of the work's argument against the Arians. Most of the orations consist in a painstakingly disquisition on the correct interpretation of contested biblical texts. See dot AR dot one point thirty seven through three point sixty seven. Antonatius addresses himself to the caricature or caricatured method of Arian exegesis, uh, which seeks to prove that Christ is not divine on the basis of the lowly passages of Scripture. Uh, the Arians' chief problem, in his view, is that they perceive Christ as human deeds and attributes. In scripture, such as Jesus' statement, quote, my soul is troubled, end quote, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 20, uh, 39, on Luke's comment that Jesus, quote, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, end quote, Luke 2.52, uh, says Luke 2.52, and conclude from them that the Word of God must have been a creature, see dot AR, dot 3.26, 27, 59, uh, 54. And replying, Athanasius argues repeatedly that Christ's human experiences, and especially his death on the cross, were not the, express, the, the experiences of the Word, but of his human flesh alone. It was the Word's humanity that was exalted after the suffering death, Philippians 2.19. Since the Word is always divine and needs no exaltation, sometimes such as these uh, statements, such as these, Athanasius explains, are made, quote, humanly, end quote which references to the flesh that the word took on, while others are said, quote, divinely, end quote, such as, quote, the word was God, end quote, John 1, 1. And Donatius presses the distinction so far as to say that the human statements do not really apply to the word, but to us. And Philippians 2 does not indicate that the word is exalted, but that we are exalted. See dot AR 1.41. The key to producing a pious interpretation, as Nations explains, is to identify the correct figure or person, plus upon, being referred to as well as the subject of time of what is being said. And the above example of the Arians err by failing to attribute Christ's sufferings and exaltations to the plus upon of his humanity or his body, rather than the plus upon of the divine word. See dot AR uh, dot 1.54 to 55. Uh, divine and human statements, in other words, have distinct references, which Athanasius denotes in, pas in one passage. This is, a, this is a word here. I think it's a Greek. I don't know. I can't pronounce it. They see dot, AR dot, 2.62. And this, uh, this hermeneutical distinction is essential for maintaining anti-Aryan orthodoxy. The limits of suffering and the loss of humanity. The exegetical divide that Antonatius imposes on the biblical material has two major consequences for his Christology, uh, both of which are further developments of ideas we saw in against the pagans on the Incarnation. The first concerns the limitations of the Word, and the second concerns the humanity of Christ and the Christians. So the consequences of Antonatius' ex exegesis show themselves most clearly in his understandings of Christ's suffering and death. In order to preserve the Word's divinity from what he sees as the intrusion of lowly human affairs, on which the Arian heresy is supposedly based, uh, Antonatius is emphasize, emphasizes that the Word did not die on the cross, but only its body or flesh did. Moreover, the real epiphany of the Incarnation runs counter to Christ's suffering and death. Somewhat like Origen and against Celsus, Antonatius is concerned to protect, quote, the glory of divinity, end quote. From the ignominy of death in his anti-Aryan works, much as he did before in the dual apologetic work, even though Christians may say that the Word suffered in the flesh, it is imperative to bear in mind that, in fact, the Word did not suffer in the Incarnation because it is by nature impossible. And so the human passions did not touch the Word, but instead the Word destroyed the affections. See dot AR dot 3.31-34. Hence, quote, it is not lawful to say that the Lord was in terror, end quote. See dot AR dot 3.56. As a rule, when Athanasius gives voice to the word sufferings in the, in the Incarnation, he typically issues an immediate qualification to the effect that, of course, the word did not really suffer after all. Athanasius' repeated qualifications in this regard aim to preserve the word from contamination by human suffering and to keep it safely removed from the contact 
with the mess at hand. So as Athanasius demonstrates that, or what he means by his dehumanization or transhumanization and his treatment of Jesus' own divine state even before his crucifixion, when Jesus asks for information in several gospel passages such as how many loaves of bread the disciples have among them, or where Lazarus lay, see John 6, 6, 11, 14. Athanasius comments that he is not in fact ignorant as he seems to be. Or as ignorance is natural to the flesh, it is not to the divinity for this reason. Quote, Jesus knew what was in everyone, in quote, John 2, 25. Jesus is pre, pre, pre science, prescience, likewise, applies to his claim that he does not know the day or the hour of his death, Mark 8, 32. Although Jesus protests that he is ignorant, Athanasius maintains that, in fact, he does know the time of death, of his death. C.A.R. 3.42 the reason why Jesus said he did not know the hour of his death was quote because of the flesh end quote because human existence is naturally ignorant of such thing consequently we quote ascribe to the human his humanity and quote Jesus' ignorance and everything else that he says humanly yet Athanasius continues Jesus' statement in John's gospel quote father the hour is come and quote John 17 1 shows that he indeed in fact knows the hour as word here again, Athanasius divides Christ into two distinct reference or subjects, yet in terms of Jesus' operative psychology, the word serves the function of Jesus' mental apparatus, as shown by the concluding explanation. Divinely, the word knows all things, just as only the Son knows the Father in Matthew 11:27. yet Jesus says, quote, I don't know, end quote, in order to show that he had put on flesh that was ignorant. See that AR dot 3.44 through 45 does Jesus' divinity as the word of God blots out any human ignorance that he might appear to suffer as a human being he is not in fact ignorant but only speaks as though he were so you see the problems already right like look he's either the man or he's the deity this is why it's important to understand the double subject it's like he either is experiencing true human experience like we are or he isn't and so that's what I'm saying the whole problem is ascribing to him both natures of two persons that's why I said the Bible doesn't maybe it says it says here in this book it says similarly Antonius rolls out the possibility of real human development on Jesus's part on Luke 252 quote Jesus advanced in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, end quote. Athanasius comments that, quote, Jesus Christ is not a human being like all other humans, but is God who bears flesh, end quote. So to imagine that Jesus actually grew and developed like other people would be equivalent to the adoptionist doctrine of Paulus and Minnesota, which Athanasius believed the Arians hold, although they won't admit it, because Jesus is the enfleshed word who once, quote, existed equal to God, end quote. Philippians 2.6 he cannot possibly have advance in wisdom and grace. At most, we can say that Jesus grew physically in the flesh, whereas what may appear to be mental growth is merely the words gradual self-manifestation and a human body which is God's temple. In this view, Jesus contains no developing the human mind at all and so cannot be said to have these finite aspects of human mental life. Or does he have any fear or death, a fear of death, as the Gospels seem to indicate and to think that he did is unseemly and impious. But that's what I'm saying. The effects of the human nature, though, are not supposed to affect his divinity if he is omniscient. That's why it's actually incorrect to say that God is ignorant in a human nature. Because a human nature, human limitations, human ignorance, human suffering, human death, does not limit deity, which is the opposite of that. That's why it's never one person in two different nature, nor is it two sons. So it's a heavy burden to try to prove that. Which is a confusion of the persons of God the Word and the man who is the Word made flesh, right? This is a central principle and ultimate focus on Gregory's Christology is the union of God and human existence. In the person of Jesus, the unity of Christ lies at the heart of Gregory's understanding of the Christian life as a whole.
and it forms the basics, the basis of his polemical arguments against all three of his major Christological opponents, Enomius, Diodor, and Apollinarius, as was the case for Eusebius, the confession or, quote, theolo theologizing, end quote, of Christ's identity as the Son of God, is the key to the knowledge of God and of all creatures of life. In several respects, Gregory's Christology is synonymous with his understanding of salvation and Christian spirituality. Key statement from Gregory's third theological oration spares quoting at length since it expresses several of the basic motives of his Christology. Here Gregory is directly addressing the Eunomians who denied that Christ is a divine is as is as divine as God the Father, yet he also as the has Diodor and Apollinarius Apollinarius in view. It says uh, the one whom you now scorn was once above you. The one who is now human was at one point not com composite. What he was, he continued to be. Where he was not, he assumed. In the beginning, he existed without cause. For what is the cause of God? But later, he was born for a cause, namely that you might be saved. He took upon himself your dickness, associating with flesh through the intermed intermediary of a human mind, and being made a human being who is God on earth. Um, since human existence was blended with God and he was born as a single entity because the one who is more powerful prevailed over his assumed humanity so that he might be made divine just as he was made human. Oration is 29.19. So as this passage shows Gregory's views, uh, Gregory views Christ's identity as dynam in dynamic narrative terms. His divinity is not a static thing but the agent of the drama of salvation. Who unites with himself the fullness of human existence. For Gregory, human existence and indeed the entire cosmos is a direct reflection of God's superabundant being, goodness, and light. Orations 38.7, 940.5. Yet among all, good, all God's works, human beings are the fullest expression of God's wisdom and generosity, even above the angels. Oration 38.11. So the nature of human existence, moreover, is to grow constantly in a transforming participation in the divine nature, a process that Gregory boldly calls, quote, divinization, and quote, theosis, a term that he coined himself. This is uh, one of Gregory's most telling expressions, is the statement that Christ is, quote, one and the same, and quote, son of God, both before and in the incarnation. He writes to Cleodinus, quote, we teach one and the same God and Son, end quote, who was at first only the divine Son, but at a latter time also became a human being, quote, so that by the same, the same one who is a complete human being and also God, all of humanity which had fallen under sin might be created anew, end quote. It, this is Ep.101.13-15. And so here Gregory adopts a unitive phrase from his made of Eusebian tradition, which appears also in Apollinarius, as we have seen in a way that is unique among the Cap his Cappadocian contemporaries, as well as Athanasius. Likewise, he accepts Apollinarius' comparison of a human soul and body. Like a human being, God and human existence are originally different natures that now exist in, quote, one and the same, end quote, son of God. And the two things are one entity. One account of their mingling episode that is on account of their mingling. This is EP.101.18-21. However, since Gregory believes that Christ possesses a human mind, he alters the comparison from a, little, a literal image, the word is soul, to Christ's human body, to a metaphorical comparison. The Divine Son is united with Christ's full humanity in a way similar to the union of a human soul and body. Because finally, Gregory also tends to speak of Christ as possessing one divine nature, a choice that will have enormous repercussions in later centuries. Gregory's preference for single nature expressions reflects the crucial asymmetry that exists between God and humanity and Christ. Because the nature of the divine son is radically transcendent of creation, the composition of divinity and humanity is not like a mixture of two similar type of things. Like different ingredients on a, in a food recipe, which the common term, quote, natures, and quote, could suggest, Gregory's practice of speaking of Christ as one divine nature also emphasizes that Christ is fundamentally divine. He is, quote, God made visible, in quote, to those who are able to perceive his true identity. Orations 30.20. Uh, and it reinforces the idea that Christ never exists as a human being independent of the life of the divine son.
While it is also possible to speak of Christ as possessing two natures, in Gregory's view, it is least uh, less desirable. When Gregory does not speak of Christ as two natures, it is almost always to express the two different things from which Christ is composed, after which he has become, quote, one thing, in quote, Orations 37.2. Otherwise, the, distinct, the distinction between two natures and the incarnation Christ is possible. Um, uh, incarnation Christ is possible only through human abstraction, like differentiating a human soul from his body. Orations 30.8. The confession that Christ possesses a single divine nature expresses his most fundamental identity, and in doing so, it, it reiterates the basic rationale and saving purpose of the incarnation, a divine son's union and mixture of fallen human existence within his eternal divine life in order to heal and save it. This is Christ's singular identity can be truly expressed only in deeply paradoxi paradoxical assertions. The one who is uncontained now moves from place to place. The one who exists beyond time has come to exist within time, and the invisible one has, has now become visible. Orations 37.1-3 Nevertheless, Gregory's notion of the singular identity of Christ reflects the traditional rule of faith and most of the 4th century creeds, including those of Nicaea and 325, Antioch in 341, and Constantinople in 381. It says here, the suffering God, the most obviously paradoxical statement that Christ concerned about Christ concern his suffering and death. And here we come to the heart of Gregory's Christology. For Gregory, the focus and climax of Christ's saving work is the cross. The whole purpose of the Divine Son's incarnation was so that he could undergo a human death in order to save us. A key test case for how to understand Christ's suffering is Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane and his cry of abandonment from the cross, quote, My God, my God, look upon me. Why have you forsaken me? Quote, Psalm 21, 1. Gregory strongly opposes the view that God truly abandoned Christ in his suffering and death, uh, prob probably referring to Diodor. In such a case, there would clearly be two different acting subjects. On the contrary, Gregory writes, Jesus' cry does not show God's abandonment of him, as if God were afraid of suffering, but rather his incorporation of Christ's human suffering into the divine life. This is the very heart of Christ's saving work and his ultimate dissolution. Shows just how fully divine the Son has assumed and represented our fallen condition. Quote, making our thoughtlessness and waywardness his own. End quote. Orations 30.50. Yeah, so the darkest hour of Jesus' suffering uh, doesn't indicate absence of God, but God's inclusion in our abandonment. Uh, within his saving embrace and healing presence, and this human desolation, despair, and ultimate, ultimately death. And just as Moses can be a god to Pharaoh, but a servant of God, so Christ's human mind can govern his body while also being subject to God, with no contradiction. On this point, Gregory parts company with Origen and Antonius as well, in that he does not regard the Incarnation as an ontological problem. This will also be a major dividing line among later theologians. Christ's basic identity, yeah, Christ's basic identity, therefore, is is his divinity. Uh, he is not a, quote, lordly man, in quotes, as the Apollinarians are reported to hold, but, quote, our Lord and God, in quote, so too he is not, quote, a human being who is also God, in quote, but the, quote, God-man, in quote. This is ep.101.12 or .40.33. And Christians worship, quote, a man-bearing God, end quote, not, quote, God-bearing flesh. This is Ept 102.18-20. Gregory is insistent that the central operative, operative fact of Christ's identity is his divinity. Quote, if I worshipped a creature, I would not be called a Christian. Why is Christianity per precious? It is not that Christ is God, in quote, Orations 37.17. The Incarnation is above all the work of God and Christ's identity as the, quote, one and the same, in quote. Son of God who has assumed human existence in the central principle of Christian salvation and spirituality, rooted in the unity and divinity identity, uh, in the divine identity of Christ, the salvation of, or divinization of all human beings, 
is to ascend to God by means of the doctrine of Christ. Christology is therefore central to the Christian life as a whole. Through the knowledge of Christ as, quote, God made visible, and quote, Christians are divinized and elevated through faith, being made God, in response to the fact that Christ was made human. Orations 29.18 through 19. John Damascene, or Damascus. This is the Council's doctrine of the two wills. Follows Maximus closely, fairly closely. Christ has two natural wills and energies without division, change, partition, or confusion in Chalcedonian terms. Yet it is the divine will that leads his human will. Moreover, in a striking phrase, it defines Christ's human will as being, quote, proper, and quote, idion, to the word of God, on the basis of John 6, 38, quote, not my will, but the will of him who sent me, end quote. It reirritates Maximus' cardinal principle that the the presence of the Divine Son does not destroy his human will, but preserves it, giving the same quotation from Gregory Nazianzen and Max, uh, that Maximus had used, Orations 30.12. So here the single acting agent is clearly the Divine Son. Christ's two natural energies are then also affirmed, this time on the basis of Leo's tomb and a quotation repeatedly from Sura. This is finally the Council re reiterates reiterates the combination of single subject language quote one of the holy trinity and quote and chalcedonian adverbs quote without confusion and, dis and dis or distinction end quote followed by the second leontine sense of hypostasis quote from which end quote christ's miracles and sufferings both shine forth which is and ultimately the, the divisive notion the council thus condemn condemns the doctrines of monergism and monothelitism via the theology of Maximus on the one hand while upholding Chalcedon even more strongly than Maximus had even to the point of repeating the same list of authoritative documents Leo's tome and Cyril's letters against Nestorius and the Eastern bishops this is 3 const 77 2 through 76 this is 126 through 27 in this regard the council exacerbated uh, exacerbated the tensions Latin and Maximus's work and Thanks to its universal scope, forwarded those tensions into the Christology of the Eastern and Western Middle Ages. John's use of earlier sources, and hence the nature of his own doctrine, is different from Maximus in two key respects. First, he begins his study not with Gregory of Nazianzus, as Maximus did, but as a committed Chalcedonian who samples the fathers from this standpoint. Uh, second, John relies quite heavily on Leontius, uh, Leontius of Byzantium which makes him, in the end, more of a strict Chalcedonian, close to the old Antiochian doctrine and further from Gregory and Cyril uh, than Maximus was. Throughout books three and four of the Orthodox faith, John assembles various quotations and arguments from the fathers against the heretical Christology positions, the Christological positions. In the first two chapters, however, he gives an introductory presentation, presentation of his own Christology which stands in an interesting relationship to the patristic materials that well. And so even as John begins again with the unitive language, the word makes all human things his own. He enforces the Chalcedon, Chalcedonian language, or logic, so that, quote, one and the same, in quote, Christ does both human and divine things is, a kind, is again a kind of third thing. Quote, he who with each form cooperating with the other performs both divine and human acts, in quote. Quoting another passage of Leo taken from the anthology, Doctrina Patrum, Ep. 28.14, about 14. In this view, the one who does things according to the form of a servant that is humanly is not also himself still in the form of God that is divine. The human Jesus is not divine in his humanity as Gregory, Augustine, Cyril, and Maximus had each insisted he was. Following the same dualistic logic, John is likewise eager to deny that Christ's divine nature suffered. X.5.47. He goes so far as to say that, quote, we have never heard up to now that the nature of the word suffered in the flesh. X.5.55. A statement that is bound to strain the credulity of anyone in a Cyrillian tradition, and he does not want there to be any talk of God suffering, quote, in the flesh, end quote, even as Antonius was willing to do. X. This is exp.5.48, 50 to 70. 
John's understanding of Christological exegesis likewise follows that of Leontius. Both divine and human statements refer to the hypostasis so that there is one true cross predication from the divinity to the humanity, or vice versa. Quote, we never speak of uncreated flesh or humanity. End quote. This is XP.548. John's resistance to the communicatio idiomatum approaches the vigor of Diodorus, and he is quite far indeed from the single subject approach of Gregory or Cyril. Now, as you know, here I say that, uh, that Jesus is, has uncreated flesh or humanity only because he comes from the highest heaven, which is uncreated. But here, is, yes, he's saying for another reason, because he doesn't agree with Antonatius, but that's kind of the point of what I'm saying. Like, the, the problems of the single subject Christology that has basically plagued the tradition of the patristic theology is based because, like I said, it confused the two persons, as God showed me, you know. Perhaps the most glaring Chalcedonian accommodation is the way in which John merges Maximus's unitive defense of Christ's two natural wills in operations with the older, strict Chalcedonian metaphysic of Leontius. This is exp, exp.5.58-59. At the most point, John represents Maximus faithfully and well, with one important exception. Whereas for Maximus, the ultimate agent of all of Christ's divine and human acts is very clearly the divine Son of God. John has omitted Maximus' discussion of the single subjectivity of the divine Son from his excerpts because he wants to shift the idea in a Chalcedonian direction. And so for John of Damascus, the ultimate agent of Christ's divine and human acts is in fact the Leontine distinct hypothesis. A hypostasis, yeah. an idea reinforced once again by referencing to Leo's tomb. This is XP.5.59. And so in the text that John gives us, the singularity of Christ's double willing is preserved mainly in the mutual characterization of the divine and human actions themselves, and not by the divine Son of God, who is both nature and hypostasis. So though the, his rereading of the earlier tradition, John causes Maximus to appear more strictly Chalcedonian than he was. So it just talks about how John Damascus in the end produced a Christology that is fraught with even more tension than Maximus. This is like Leontius claims to be presenting unified collected teaching of the great fathers, but his collection is deliberately skewed in a strict Chalcedonian direction. This is famous synthesis of patristic thought. It's neither catalog nor a catalog nor of indifferentiated sources, nor a neutral representation of an unblemished Christological tradition. As many, as many later readers took it to be. So at the end of Patristic Age, the unity of Christ, which theologians such as like, you know, the people that we're going over, it's like, they stand in uneasy tension. But this is why like, I discern with God, with prayer. Like I listen to what these saints are saying. I read these kind of books. But as God has shown me, you don't really need training in philosophy to completely destroy this Patristic paradigm. That's why I say it's dangerous when you don't repent of error and you continue in it after many centuries. It just gets even worse. When you look at this icon of the baptism, you can clearly see the double subject here, right? The Holy Spirit and then the Son of God, the Temple of God. I said how the man, right, the Spirit, well, the God, the Logos, the Spirit of God comes from the highest heaven up here where the Father is, the uncreated heaven. Uh, he represents the Father and everlasting deity, right? The divine nature, the kingdom of heaven, right? That is where the Son is born of. That's why he has, like what I say, uncreated flesh or uncreated humanity, right? Or uh, this divine Son, but is born of everlasting divinity, which has to do with the kingdom of heaven. That's why he has heavenly flesh. Uh, even the Son just makes the distinction of being from heaven, right? From that heaven and stuff. So you don't really need to get lost in that confusion of the, the patristic problems. The baptism in this icon shows you what I'm saying. It's not a perichoresis where the mutual indwelling of all three persons, the whole trinity and the man, with not a single one of them is the man though. And you know how God, right, the reason why they keep struggling because they keep like assuming that it's the same person. It's not the same person. And it's not two sons. Does this look like two sons to you? Is that, that the Son of God, or is this the Son of God? Which person is the Son of God? The temple of God, the man, that's why he suffers and dies. 
A man can have the form of God, even be by definition, but what does God mean? The kingdom is also God, right? The light is God, fire is God, spirit is God, right? God is light, God is spirit, God is fire, right? That's why I say the uncreated divinity of the Son of God, because he's from that kingdom. Because the end of the day, he's the type of man, he's the type of Adam. I'm reading from the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Yeah, well, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, right? And uh, the Father that he's begotten of, right? I'm not saying there's two fathers, but there's one that represents the Father to us. That is the Spirit of God, divine life, and the Son of God is begotten of that, of that person. This is begotten of the Father before all ages. Light of light, true God of true God. That's everlasting deity, right? Begotten, not created. With one essence, right? The heavenly essence with the Father through whom all things were made. Yeah, because Jesus represents the fullness of God the Word. Because he has the nature of the Word and the person. But like I said, that if anyone's God the Word, it's the Spirit of God. Who represents the uncreated heaven, heaven before all worlds, right? Where the sun is born. Because God created heaven and earth, like it says here in the, in the beginning of the creed. But the Spirit, through the Spirit of God, because the Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, right? The Spirit of God, breath of God, gives life to the Word. And so through whom all things are made, I mean, yeah, because the Word is, is, you could say is Jesus, because He has the fullness of the Word, because He has the nature of, it's like, to be born of the Spirit is to have a light, be word of word. He has the fullness of the Spirit. That's why I said, like, like to me, that is proof of that he is born of the highest heaven because he is with the, with the Spirit without measure. It says, uh, like, as the Spirit of God is in him, then that's, that would be God, the Logos, the person of the word. And then, uh, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary and became man he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and he rose on the third day according to the scriptures like but the word has to assume a man though like I mean the Holy Spirit has to assume a, a man right a man who can have faith and can follow faithfully so it can't just be a, a general human nature, an impersonal human nature, or anything like that. It has to be an actual man that is incarnate of the Holy Spirit. And so yes, and then it's, uh, it's according to the scriptures. It's a, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, because He ascends with the Spirit of God. So you could technically still have a Trinity, right? They ascend back to where the Father is. And says, His kingdom shall have no end, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the creator of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets, right? Because he's speaking, he sends Moses, right? And Moses is like the type of Jesus and the Spirit of God, right? Who he's speaking to is where the Son is from. Because yeah, the type of Jesus is Moses, though. That's what I'm saying. Like, he spoke through the prophets and one holy Catholic apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. So how do you read this single subject into this idea? Like, I mean, into this creed? Like, I don't know. There's one that is begotten, a man from heaven, right? And there is one indwelling. Right, the one who represents heaven, the God, right? So, anyway, I just wanted to make this video showing you the problems with the Christological patristic tradition. There's a burden, an unnecessary burden. So that liberty and freedom would probably, I would say, would heal you from this, from this wound because you at least be given the freedom to discuss the ideas. Because uh, I just showed you, it doesn't take much to destroy this entire paradigm. It just takes this icon right in front of me.
That's all it takes to point out the massive contradiction which ties into your theologies and your theophanies. Because every time you mention Jesus, the Son of God, you say, which person is he? Is he the temple of God, the man, or is he the deity? And so the man can have the form of deity, and yet be by nature a man, but even the divine son. Man born of heaven, because that's still a man. And so, anyway, and if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Thank you, and God bless.